Okay, so um, before I talk about the good telescopes, let's talk about the bad ones. Um, a lot of people, when they're just wanting to start on astronomy, um, they get, let me make sure that you guys can see. Are you seeing, I have things overlaying my screen. Is everybody not seeing that? You're seeing yeah, my we, presentation? Okay. We, yeah. Okay, so often in the astronomy club, we'll get a call from somebody who said they just bought a telescope for their kids and can we help them with them? And then we go to their houses and we see that it's uh, the kind of telescope that doesn't work very well. So we affectionately call this a DST or department store telescope. And uh, their attributes are that they have a very kind of thin, flimsy mount. Usually it's a very small plastic refractor with a plastic lens um, an, of eyepiece that gives you a very narrow field of view and no way to really follow the sky. And one of the best uh, ways to tell that you're looking at one of those is that they will claim to have very high power, like 525 times. Or I just saw one listed at 625 times magnification. Virtually no telescope does that kind of magnification. Can you hold it? And uh, this is what one looks like. So um, I've downloaded a few uh, Amazon.com amusing reviews from people who bought these. This one says, looks like telescope that does not work like that. Bought for my son. Looks like a decent telescope from the outside appearance and also durable. My son tried very hard to see stars and moon. After a lot of work, he said, all I see is a bunch of branches of trees and roof of house, no stars. Don't keep big expectations. Still, my son enjoys this telescope and plays with his friends. So I feel it is of some worth. Okay, so the review number two, not worth the money. I, whoops, not worth the money. I bought this on sale and with a coupon on top of that and still isn't worth the money. Looks very cool. My son's so excited, but we couldn't make it work. We cannot focus a telescope on nothing, not even the big moon, much less a star. Total trash. Number three, great value for the price. The telescope is larger than expected. My son was very surprised. And number four tells it like it is. I get that this is a basic model telescope, but it's terrible even just looking at the moon. Very low quality lenses. The parts are too loose and cannot be tightened. Can't get the telescope to stay in position because of it. Highly disappointed. Even if you're a beginner, pay extra for a better quality telescope. That's excellent advice. So my telescope actually was a department store telescope. My first one when I was 11 years old, and I brought home a straight A report card. My dad rewarded me with a Gilbert telescope. And I was very, very excited, but I remember seeing a kind of a fuzzy moon with lots of colors around it. And eventually I used it to look at the tallest building in Midland, Texas, which is the Wilco building. And I could read the sign on it. That's what I used to ended up using it for. Um, so the problems with the, a bad telescope are that they have a rickety mount. So the tel every time you touch it, uh, the view vibrates. Um, they're difficult to aim because when you, you think you've aimed at a star or moon, then you tighten it down and it moves a little bit, not where you thought you had aimed. There's poor optics, so um, the view's just not all that sharp. There's a very narrow field of view and yet no thing that follows the sky, so once you've found something, it races out of the view within a few seconds. And, and then the eyepieces are often, uh, the, the power is too high for that type of telescope. So what you want in a good telescope is a very stable mount. So when you touch the telescope, it feels firm. It doesn't uh, wobble at all as you touch it. You can move it around, let go of it, and it's stable. You want a reasonable size aperture, which I will describe later, but aperture is how is the diameter of either the mirror or the lens, which is collecting the light. And um, you, you need something that has a little bit of size to it in order to be able to see very much in the sky. Um, you need good optics, so that's how accurate the, the mirror or the lens is ground, so that uh, it focuses very well. You want something that's easy to use, um, doesn't take a lot of, uh, lot of your effort to try to aim it. And um, you want one of the two of these, either a wide field of view, so you see a little bit bigger piece of the sky, um, or you want a clock drive or a motor which follows the stars as they move across the sky. Um, without that, you want the wide field of view. That allows you some time to look at something of interest before it, it gradually drifts. Uh, if you don't have that, you can tell kids that you are actually watching the Earth turn while you're looking through that kind of telescope. As you watch, a star may drift slowly across the field. That's because you are standing on a giant merry-go-round and it's turning while you're looking at that star or, or object. 
And most important attribute you want is one that you will use. So uh, one that doesn't just sit in your closet that you feel is easy enough and that you will um, use often. Um, so that that's, the bright telescope for everybody varies. And often uh, amateur astronomers after a while will develop, get a menagerie of telescopes, one that's easy to, that's easily portable, another one for a, a large aperture um, to, to really get the bang for the galaxy buck. Um, but uh, if you only get one telescope, this is very important to make sure that one is, a, is one that you'll be happy with for quite a long time. So first we're gonna talk about mounts, and mount has to do with how the telescope is um, mounted onto a, either a tripod or a rocker box, which I'll show you later, and how it moves. Um, so on the left we see a refractor, and it says out azimuth. What that means is this particular telescope has two motions. One is up and down, out is short for altitude, and one motion, uh, one, one axis is side to side. So azimuth points to different compass directions. This is not, this is aligned with the horizon and the zenith of, the, of uh, their sky, but it's not really the way the stars move. Uh, but it, it can have advantages for certain types of telescopes for ease of use. Then we have um, a, a compound telescope, which we'll talk about later, which is mounted on an equatorial fork. I think you, I was told you can see my mouse. So the fork refers to this, um, these uh, kind of supports on the side of the telescope and it's shaped like a fork. That's why they call it a fork. And that's very common for these short telescopes called Smith Cassegrains. And then there's a German equatorial mount, which I'll have a better, better picture of you for you later. And um, this is one, uh, the equatorial scopes are ones that align with the, basically the base of the telescope, which you don't quite see here, but the telescope is aligned, one axis is aligned with the equator, and I'll explain why that works. It means that when the telescope follows the sky, it only needs to move in one direction, one big circle. Uh, so why is that? Well, I like to tell kids that if they were standing at the North Pole, um, they would look straight up, see the North Star, and we're just very fortunate that we happen to have a bright star directly above the Earth's axis. Um, straight at the point, the north, uh, the ac north end of the axis points almost straight at the star Polaris. And the stars would appear to simply rotate around you in a circle. So you're standing on a giant merry-go-round, and the, as the Earth is turning, the stars would not rise or set, they would just circle around you. Now let's say you had, would, wanted a telescope to follow the sky, all you have to do is put a big turntable on the ground underneath you, put the telescope on there, and then start a motor which follows the star around the sky. It does, basically, the turntable just turns in a circle. Now, what an equatorial mount does is it adjusts for your latitude. So if you look at the diagram on the right, Houston is not at the North Pole. It's two thirds of the way toward the equator. For us now, the North Star is about one third of the way up the sky. About, we're at latitude 29 degrees plus some change. So for us, Polaris is about 29 degrees above the horizon, 90 degrees is straight up. And what the equatorial mount does is it basically makes the telescope think it's at the North Pole. So um, it's, it's one axis is going in this direction. As it's going in a circle, it's going this way instead of this way. So here's a, a equatorial mount. And by the way, I'm mentioning equatorial mounts, even though to some degree they're coming, becoming obsolete, due to uh, computer controls, which can turn on more than one axis, on two axes. But an equatorial mount really shows you how the sky works. So um, an equatorial mount, the telescope, need, has some, some fine adjustments. It needs to be pointed at the North Star at the beginning of the evening. Once you, when it's pointed, when it is, its um, setting circle says that it's at 90 degrees. So when the telescope thinks it's looking 90 degrees um, from, uh, from the equator, then at that point, the motor will turn on and it will turn in a circle and any star or galaxy you're on will stay in the view. Um, so the, the diagram on the right sort of shows you how that works. Um, now, there are also telescopes um, that are very simple, invented by John Dobson, which have really revolutionized an amateur astronomy. And these dispense with the equatorial mount. Um, they are very, very simple. They're alt azimuth, meaning that they have a base, which is on a turntable, which turns side to side. So that just turns to different compass directions. And then there is a ball bearing. The tube fits in that base, and it can move easily up and down. 
And one attribute of these telescopes is they can be easily homemade. They're very, very simple. Um, because they don't use clock drive, they revolutionize the size of the telescopes that amateurs could afford without, um, without paying many more thousands of dollars for the motor that follows the sky. Um, at this point, they're also Dobsonians, as they're called, that also have a clock drive. Uh, but again, that about doubles the cost of the telescope. Um, what makes these work is they're very easy to point, very easy to, to move from one side of the sky to the other, and they have a wide enough field of view, which I'll explain about field of view a little bit later, so that when you're looking at something, it'll stay there for a good minute or so. It's not racing out of view. This is John Dobson, who uh, died a few years ago. Um, he was a sidewalk astronomer in San Francisco, um, a little bit of an eccentric personality, but um, his invention has, has basically changed amateur astronomy. So what telescopes do? Well, there's, they either have a lens or a mirror which bends light rays or redirects light rays. So all of them take light rays coming into their end um, at parallel and bend those rays so that they eventually come to the same point to a focus, usually near the eyepiece. A refractor uses a lens, so it uses a, a good refractor will use usually more than one piece of glass at the end of the telescope and, and then redirect the rays um, through the shape of the lens to where they all meet at the focus. And that telescope has to be as long, the, the length of time it takes those rays to come together is the length of the telescope. So it has the focal length, as we call it, has, the telescope itself has to be at least that long. Then there are reflecting telescopes, which are invented by Isaac Newton. And um, those use, instead of a, a lens, they use a mirror. So the mirror, in that case, is at the base of the telescope. Uh, the light comes in this way. And the mirror is also ground to a, a type of curve so that no matter where a light ray hits, it's all directed to the same spot. Now, reflect, a simple reflector also has to have a, um, a, a, another mirror here to direct the light out the side. And I have a diagram of that later, go a little bit more detail. Then there's what we call the compound telescopes, uh, Cassegrains, Schmidt Cassegrains. These direct the light rays more than once through the, um, through the tube. So the Schmidt Cassegrain directs the light all the way down to a mirror, all the way back to a smaller mirror up here, and then down through a, actually a, a hole in the mirror, in the main mirror uh, here, and then all the light rays come down here. So one, two, three. Those tubes can literally be three times shorter than the light path. There's also something called a corrector plate over here, which is a piece of glass, not really a mirror. It's, what it does is it, um, it, it uh, redirects the light rays slightly to help them come to a focus at the, by the time they hit the eyepiece. Okay, focal length. Um, the focal length is the, is the distance from the mirror or lens to the point where all the light rays come together, the focal point. And that can vary from telescope to telescope. So you can have a short focal length um, or you can have a longer focal length. And there are advantages and disadvantages to both. Normally we'll use a shorter focal length for deep sky objects and longer focal lengths are advantageous, especially for planetary observing and, and double stars. So here, here they are again. Um, the, there's also differences in field of view. So a longer focal length will have a narrower field of view when you look at an eyepiece, and a short focal length will have a wide angle field of view. So most of the Dobsonians, those simple telescopes that John Dobson built, have a wide angle field of view and a short focal length. So the light rays come together in a short distance of time from the uh, mirrors. And many of those mirrors are very large. Now, aperture is what you really want to be concerned with when you're buying a telescope. Not the power of the eyepiece, that varies. Um, every eyepiece does a different power according to the aperture of the telescope. Um, and it's aperture that allows you to use a little bit more magnification without losing the quality of the view. And it, aperture basically um, is also how bright an object is. So the, uh, an aperture, a bigger aperture can, uh, can see fainter objects, and it can brighten objects more than a, than a smaller aperture. Um, so that's, ap the aperture of the telescope refers to the diameter of the lens 
or the, or the mirror, and it's usually expressed in either inches or millimeters. Now there's also another term you need to know, which is focal ratio, and that is the focal length divided by the aperture. So for instance, I happen to have um, an eight inch F7 telescope. Um, mean, what that means is that my, my uh, mirror is eight inches across, and it takes seven times that, that diameter for the light rays to come to a focus. So I have a, so that means 56 inches later, my, the light rays would focus on my telescope. I also, also have a F10, um, which I'll show you a little bit later. So anyway, here's F4.5, which often is good for deep sky, and here's an F8. Um, so that's a ratio, again, of the focal length to the aperture. So um, here is, uh, let's see if I can get that out of the way. Um, so I can't remember what, how many, this is I think something like a eight inch F or a seven inch F5 reflector. And notice that the tube is fairly short in this case. And then here's an F10 refractor. So it has a fairly small lens and then the length time that it takes those rays to get down to this eyepiece that's going to be 10 times the diameter of the lens. And that's, that's going to be a longer, thinner tube. Now, this is a schmidt cassegrain I say guess the focal ratio. Um, it notices the tube is very, very short, but that's deceptive because, again, the light rays are bouncing back not just one time, but three times before they come to a focus. So this little short telescope actually has a focal ratio of F10. Now, uh, eyepieces are what determine magnification. Um, so the focal length of eyepieces is, is marked on the eyepiece in millimeters. A larger number is a lower power, a smaller number is a higher power. So here's a set of eyepieces. Um, and I'll, we'll talk about the barrel size a little bit later. Um, but, um, but they are, uh, here's a six millimeter, eight millimeter. Those would be high power eyepieces for looking at planets, maybe on a good night. And then we've got 21 millimeters, which is a lower power um, with some telescopes that probably will range from 50 to 800 times power, depending on the size of the telescope. And those are great for looking at deep sky. Um, I'm going to discuss barrel size later, but I realize now I have a slide that shows um, these kind of convertible eyepieces. So one of the sizes of, of um, barrels, which is what fits into the focuser of the telescope, is one and a quarter inches and another common size is two inches. So the ones that you see like this with two barrels are designed to fit into either type of telescope. These over here are two inch eyepieces which are normal for larger telescopes. So again here's the standard size barrels. The 0.965 which I had on my first uh, five inch uh, Schmidt Cassegrain telescope is, has become obsolete but you might find it still in some uh, older telescopes. And then one and a quarter inch is a highly standard size for medium sized telescopes and two inches for large telescopes. I'm hearing that we're beginning to get three inch eyepieces. I haven't seen one, is that right, Joe? Joe's nodding. Um, for even for, uh, since our telescopes are getting larger and larger, our eyepieces are, are giving us more and more generous windows to the sky. So here's some eyepiece terms. Uh, one is eye relief, not this. Um, but eye relief has to do with how far your eye can be away from the eyepiece um, to see, to get a view. So some of them have long eye relief and some have, um, a long eye relief gives you a little bit more room to move your head around and still see whatever you're looking at. And uh, often a, narrow, a, a higher power eyepiece, unless it's a specialized one, will often give you uh, less eye relief, meaning you have to have your eye exactly at the right spot to see something. So if you have a little difficulty looking through a telescope the first time, um, move your eye around. You usually need to be about an inch from the eyepiece. And, you, and um, for most of them, you need to be reasonably lined up through the eyepiece. So often children turn their heads. And I finally figured out why. I believe that is because of their, the, um, the distance between their noses and their eyes. So I think their nose gets in the way. If one eye looks straight down the eyepiece, I believe they're ending up with their nose in the way. And so they always turn their head and end up looking at the side of the eyepiece instead of down there. For, I, I've always wondered and I finally realized that was it. Their, their noses and their eyes are too close together. So you really need to uh, work with them to take one eye and look straight through an eyepiece. 
and that's true for adults too. Um, now another term is exit pupil, and that is the diameter of the of the of the um, image that hits your eye, so or the light that exits the eyepiece. So the dark adapted eye is, is between about five millimeters and nine millimeters of dilation, the, pup the pupil of your eye. So you can use up to about nine millimeters of, of um, exit pupil. Uh, over that, you're not really gaining any light. And uh, again, for a narrow exit pupil, that's often where you really need to have your eye in exactly the right spot. Now magnification is going to vary from for, for your specific telescope and eyepiece, and, but you can calculate it. So it is the focal length of the telescope divided by the focal length of the eyepiece. So the eyepiece has it marked on there in millimeters, and your, if your telescope size is expressed in inches, the conversion is um, the, the conversion is one inch equals 25.4 millimeters. So for a five inch F10 telescope, which is the first one I had, the focal length is 10 times five inches or 50 inches. That equals 1,270 millimeters. Now when I put an eyepiece in, I had a 25 millimeter eyepiece for that first telescope. I, all I have to do is divide 1,270 by 25, and that gives me the, um, the magnification that I would see in my telescope with a 25 millimeter eyepiece. And that was about 50.8 times. So 50 to 80 times is about what you want for looking at most deep sky objects in most telescopes. Um, now, the other thing about aperture and its relationship to magnification is there's an effective maximum magnification. Believe me, it's not 525 or 625 in amateur size, most amateur size telescopes, like these little department store telescopes say. So um, you can calculate the effective maximum magnification, this is only on a very good night, is about 60 times your aperture. So for my uh, first five inch telescope, the maximum possible good image it could be is 300 times magnification. But that requires what we call superb seeing. That means that the um, air must be extremely still, no cold fronts passing, no turbulence in the air, no wind, usually looking high in the sky, not low where there's more turbulence in the atmosphere. So to see if those kinds of magnifications for most telescopes, you need very still air. Fortunately, we live in Houston, Texas, that hot, humid, sticky, still, uh, hazy air is actually great for seeing planets. Um, so again, the larger an aperture you have, the more effectively you can look at higher power up to a point. One problem is that larger telescopes also are brighter. They often wash out colors in, in, uh, in planets sometimes, and they also magnify the effect of the turbulence in the atmosphere. So occasionally you will see actually a planet will appear sharper in a smaller telescope than a larger one, but you want a reasonable amount of aperture to get the very best views. Now aperture determines the brightness of the object you're looking at. So um, that the, there's a set brightness that come, of the light that comes into your telescope, and that's, that stays that way no matter how much you magnify it. So, there, you'll find that the ideal magnification for an object varies according to its, um, its inherent brightness, uh, how spread out it is. There's always a point of diminishing return with, with magnifying. So here's an image that gives you that idea. So Saturn um, would look, have the same brightness in all of these uh, images here, but it's spread out. So as you can see, there'll be a point where Saturn will start to fade out and also get fuzzy around the edges if you try to go too high a power. So um, the maximum power you might want to use um, in any one night is going to vary according to how good the, the, the seeing and the transparency. So how clear the area, air is and how steady it is. So deep sky objects in general use lower powers. Um, so this is uh, the Orion Nebula at 100 times in a 12 inch f4.9 telescope. And um, then what happens is, is amateur astronomers get aperture fever. I call this slide the dangers of aperture fever. Um, the, some of the largest commercially made Dobsonian telescopes have, are up to 36 inches. And uh, they require, of course, a lot of uh, trailer space to carry them and give spectacular views. But for, because these are Newtonian telescopes with the eyepiece at the top of the telescope, um, you also have to climb very high to look in, in them. 
So telescope types, the advantages and disadvantages. Um, you, the king for planets and double stars, if that's your main interest, which is a great interest if you're in an urban area, is the refractors. And um, one of the Rolls Royce of the refractors is Takahashi. I know there's some others that are excellent. Refractors are quite expensive for their aperture. Um, they have a good, a good one will have heavy mounts, superb optics. They will have more pinpoint stars usually than you can get with reflectors um, on average for the very best refractors. Colors are beautiful and uh, plants will be more sharp and a really excellent refractor. And we have amateur astronomers who really swear by their, their refractors. So Takahashi makes a seven inch refractor for many thousands of dollars, but that's enough to get really good deep sky um, objects also, and just superb planetary images. Now refractors, um, disadvantages are that it can be very expensive for the degree of aperture. The tube has to be as long as the focal length. There's no way to condense the, the light path. Um, so that limits its portability. They tend not to be made in very large, um, very big apertures. And they're subject to something called chromatic aberration, which I will explain in a minute, but that can be corrected. Um, their advantages are that they are often, if they're a good quality refractor, but have superb optics. Um, they're relatively low maintenance, meaning they don't have to be collimated. They, you don't have to reline up the optics over and over again. They, that tends to be fixed. Um, they can they give uh, very good deep sky images for the for the for the aperture, and there's what we call there's no aperture loss. In other words, all the light that comes into the lens is not lost; it all travels to the eyepiece. Whereas most of the reflectors have something in the way, either the secondary mirror um, or or a usually a second mirror gets in the way to redirect the light, and that's actually taking some of the aperture of your mirror away. Um, they have, the, by, by definition, a refractor has to have a closed tube, and that means the air inside the refractor tends to be more stable, which is also better for your image. And, um, and they also can have very good color rendition, so color, uh, colorful double stars will be more colorful in a refractor than a reflector. Now, what they're subject to, which good refractors have to correct, is chromatic aberration. So refractors use a lens, um, to bend light, they slow it down differentially because all light goes slower through glass than through air. And, um, but the problem is, is that the different colors of light bend different amounts. So with only a single lens, you're gonna get a fringing of color around whatever you're looking at because the light rays of different colors will not focus in exactly the same area. So usually with a, there's something called an apochromatic lens which has two, three pieces of glass and the combination of three pieces of glass correct that problem so that all the colors focus at the same spot. So the best refractors will be apro, apochromatic. Now for mirrors, there's something called, there's also something called spherical aberration, meaning that if you have a mirror that's a shape of a piece of the inside of a beach ball or a sphere, um, all of the light rays will not come to the same point. So most mirrors are, are not quite a sphere, they're parabolic. They're ground in such a way that, uh, that the light rays will all, um, all focus in the same spot. Now, the other thing you need to know about telescopes designed for looking at the sky is they don't worry about whether something's upside down or backwards. If you're looking at a bird or something terrestrial, you will usually have some extra optics to make things right side up and the way you see them. So refractors, which will normally also have what we call a diagonal, so the eyepiece is actually at right angles to the tube. If, they, if it has a diagonal, um, and that's what astronomical ones do, because when you're looking up, you don't want your, to be straining, you don't want your head to be looking straight up. So most refractors will turn an image backwards because the light rays are crossing as they, uh, by the time they get to your eye. Now the best uh, for deep sky are, are the reflectors, mainly because you can afford more aperture and you want aperture for deep sky to see galaxies. I finally have an 18 inch telescope and galaxies are finally looking like galaxies with lots of arms. So, um, so reflectors um, normally well, often have shorter focal lengths, um, so they don't necessarily need a clock drive. You can see something for a long time. And uh, this one is an open tube, which makes it a large aperture 
uh, portable. So you can take this off, you can fold these up, and you can put all of this in the trunk of a car. Now, reflector optics. Um, this is a uh, this is kind of a skeleton of a reflector telescope, so you can see them very well. So they have a primary lens, the primary mirror, sorry, the primary mirror down here, and it's called, you can remember it's called the primary because it's the first place that light hits. Then there's a secondary mirror. This is a, and this one's curved, so it focuses the rays. The secondary mirror is a convenience mirror. It's basically a flat mirror tilted at 45 degrees, and its only purpose is to redirect the light rays to the side of the telescope where you would insert a t uh, an eyepiece to look at them. And of course, if you didn't have that, you would have to put your head right in front of the telescope. The, the, the focus rays would be aiming straight at you and you would block all the light. So um, all Newtonians have a secondary. Now this secondary blocks a little bit of the light hitting the primary mirror. So that's why refractors have a bit of an advantage. Um, a five inch, re four inch refractor might equal the light gathering power of a five inch reflector. I also want to use this slide to point out the focusing knob over here. So all telescopes have a focus knob, which generally changes the distance of the eyepiece from the, um, from the mirror, and you can focus it for people's different vision. Um, so that if you turn a focus knob, you'll notice the eyepiece going up and down. And uh, for maybe not everybody, if you show something has 20-20 vision, they can focus it for themselves. This over here is a finder. We'll discuss finders later. So reflector advantages is that they're relatively low cost for how big they are for the aperture. They have, can have excellent optics. They're easy to set up. You don't have to screw a lot of things together if they have a Dobsonian. The open tube construction allows people to have very large mirrors and still uh, take them down, put them in a small vehicle. They have a wide field of view, which um, if that allows you to eliminate clock drive. That can reduce the cost by half. And, and then the closed tube models are resistant to dew. We'll talk about that later. Um, and then the sky's the limit these days on the size. So you know, I think the largest amateur one I've heard of is a 48 inch telescope at this point. Um, and again, this is the open tube reflector. I forgot I already have a slide. So we just discussed that. The disadvantages are that the eyepiece is elevated. So for a large tel larger the telescope, the higher up you need to get to, to, to the eyepiece. So you may have to climb up and down ladders to look at, look at something. Um, they require periodic collimation. Um, that means that the, tilt, that the mirrors tilt a little bit. They have a little bit of adjustment to them. They must be uh, in perfect alignment to focus the rays and get them out the center of the eyepiece. And that can come out of, out of alignment periodically. Uh, they have knobs and there's, uh, I, I'm not gonna talk about collimation in this talk because we have another one about that. But uh, there are not adjustment knobs for adjusting that, but that has to be done every so often. Um, uh, the, uh, the ones, the Dobsonians may be built with no clock drive, um, so they may have to, those would have to be re-aimed every couple of minutes, although now you can get Dobsonians that do have clock drive. Um, and they're subject to something called coma. This has been corrected with very good eyepieces now, but with a simple eyepiece, the design of a short wave of a short focal length telescope will tend to make the star images away from the center turn into da like little commas or dashes um, when they're off center, very far off center. Very good quality eyepieces correct that. And a little bit of aperture is lost due to the secondary mirror being in the way. Um, to collimate a telescope, the way you can tell it's um, not collimated is you would take a point of the star and then turn the focus knob until it's not focused anymore, and you will get these diffraction ring pattern. If the telescope is well collimated, that will be very concentric. If it's out of collimation, the out of focus star will look like this and it will need to be collimated. Um, if you're, you'll notice when you're trying to focus a star is it'll kind of come to a dash up and down and then it'll go to a dash side to side and it never quite comes to a point if the telescope is not collimated. Um, reflectors tend to turn the image upside down. And um, the best telescope for portability versus, um, uh, uh, and, and for ease of portability versus uh, mirror size are the Schmidt Cassegrains and Maxitop. So these are the ones that send the, send the light through the tube three times. So the tube can be, now be three times shorter. The disadvantage of the Smith Cassegrains is they're relatively expensive per aperture, 
Um, all, uh, without exception, they all have clock drive, which again, that always doubles the expense. Um, they have narrower fields of view that, that, because they have longer focal lengths, but, and again, that necessitates the clock drive. Um, they, repair, they do require periodic collimation, but much more rarely than Newtonians. Um, and then part of the aperture is lost because they also have a second mirror, which blocks the, the, the main mirror. Um, there's a little bit more inconvenience in setup. There's a few more things you've got to screw together and set up tripods. Um, they can be kind of heavy too. And they must be polar aligned. If they're equatorially mounted, that's becoming obsolete. Now a lot of, uh, of uh, the newer models use computers and no longer require polar alignment. And those are called go-to scopes. Um, advantages are, again, great portability. They fit in the trunk. They, I, I, this is the type of thing you, you, can, you don't need a SUV for them. Um, they have excellent optics. Um, but they all have clock drive, so you can really study an object without it's running out of the field. And, um, and I think I've mentioned these. The go-to models will find an object for you, and they rarely need collimation. Um, so this is a classic um, Maxitov telescope. You can find one of these. These are excellent. The Quest stars, they were made in three and a half inches, which are, is like a Rolls Royce of, of um, solar eclipse telescopes because they have great images and they're highly portable. And then there's a seven inch model. The best for na sky navigation are the go-to scopes if you don't know the sky. I would, I would question that if you, once you learn the sky, if that's really the easiest thing to use. But they, you don't need to know the sky. You plug in whatever you want to look at and the telescope will go to, their, go to it for you. Um, the disadvantages is that there's some setup time. You need to identify, some of them use GPS, which makes it easier. Um, but some of them you need to point the telescope at a couple of stars in different parts of the sky and tell the telescope. You spend a lot of time going through menus with a, with a handset. Um, I think they discourage the user from learning the sky if you're new to astronomy, and there's this extra expense with the computer components involved, but there are some inexpensive uh, small go-to telescopes right now. Um, the advantages is that um, if you have a whole list of objects, you can just go from one to the other fairly quickly. Um, however, if you really know the sky, you can go there even faster with the Dobsonian. With, the, with these, you still have to go through a menu, tell you what you, what you want it to look at, and then it slowly slews to the other side of the sky and finds it. Um, if you know the sky really well, you just swing it over and, and you're there. Um, and you could, but they are great for, say, star parties with the public or for observing a lot of objects in one night, and you have a list and you just plug them in and they go. Um, this is a classic telescope, the uh, AstroScan, which is one of the most, um, which is really one of the best for a kind of a very wide field of view, tabletop telescope, great for a, a casual road trip. If you can find one of these, they're still excellent. They have a four inch mirror, wide field of view, um, great for looking at Ple Pleiades, Andromeda Galaxy, those kinds of things, and great for going out with the kids in the car. Um, there's also, I don't know if this, I did this talk a while back, I don't know if this one still exists, but um, uh, these are sort of, these use just a spherical base inside a depression to swing across the sky. Um, here's a couple of other good starter scopes, but I would recommend going better than the starter scopes if you're going to be serious about astronomy. This one is equatorially mounted, but it does not have clock drive, so what it, it for you to follow the sky, uh, the equatorial mount allows you to, to follow a star in one axis, and it's got a slow motion control, but you've got to turn that control to follow the star, follow the star across the sky yourself. Um, this is an uh, of astronomy without borders telescope, developed as a very low cost telescope to take to the, um, say, third world countries where they can, it's affordable, and it's a small Dobsonian. Um, so the best all round, if you're just getting one telescope, we kind of still recommend in the eight to 10 inch range. They're small enough to be fairly easily portable. Um, don't take a lot of time to set up. Uh, the eight inch Dobsonian is kind of a nice height for standing um, and looking at the sky. And they're, they're big enough to get to really nice views um, without feeling like you're missing something. Um, now, finders um, often confuse new people in that the, in order to find something in the sky, your telescope sees a very tiny part of the sky. So you, you'll, in addition, have some kind of finder 
mounted to your telescope. It's got to be parallel to your telescope to work well. And what it does is it either magnifies the sky or it just gives you a target to put on the naked eye sky um, if you know where something is relative to stars that you can see. And um, so you use the finder first to find something before you look in the main telescope. So different kinds of finders. There's a, a most popular is a Telrad, uh, which is great for the large Dobsonians. And it uses, it actually creates a target on the sky. There's uh, three circles and you um, put what you're looking at in the middle of the smallest circle. And the, these circles are valuable because they actually are certain definite distances uh, in the sky. So if you need to measure it, something's three de degrees away from something, you can use these circles to do that. Uh, but this is just naked eye. You're, you're just having to go to a part of the sky where you know something is there. Um, they also have risers, which allow you just to be a little bit more comfortable looking through them, and they're not too close to the tube of the telescope. Um, this is not quite what it looks like. It looks like more uh, the target I showed you, but this is a Telrad on a riser. That's optional. Um, there's also some, the red dot finder, and that uses a red dot, which I'll show you a little bit later, um, just to aim at a part of the sky. So you actually have to cover what you're looking at. Say you were aiming at a star, you would cover that star with a red dot and you're there. Uh, then there's uh, finders are basically like half of a binocular. They magnify maybe between seven and eight times or 10 times. And um, so they are actually magnifying the sky as if you're looking through a binocular. And they are a little tricky to use. You actually need to use some open eye. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. So using your scope, the first thing you need to do is align the finder, um, meaning that you've got to have the finder looking exactly the same spot that the scope is. That's easier to do before dark on a terrestrial object, like the top of a telephone pole or a church steeple. Um, so all of the finders have some screws on them, or set screws, which allow you to slightly uh, move around, slightly move them around um, and, and change their angle a little bit. And um, so you, I recommend finding something like a tele telephone pole, centering that object, you work backwards. So you center the object in the telescope, then you go back to the finder and use the set screws to put it in the center of the finder. Then you have the telescope and the finder look at the same thing. And from then on, when something's in the middle of the finder, it'll also be in the middle of the telescope. So you start with a low power eyepiece and you do that at high power. Uh, then you re redo it with your highest power eyepiece. Um, so this is what it would look like if a finder is misaligned. Uh, in this case, let's say that this bright star, we've located it, it's now in the center of, of your eyepiece in your telescope. Uh, but when you look in the finder, uh, this red dot, this red dot finder is not on that star. So you might see this when you're aligning the finder after you've centered it. And what you do is you would take whatever screws are provided on that finder. Um, usually facing you, and you would turn those screws um, until the red dot moves over here. There's usually three of them going in different directions. So you would move the red dot over the star, and the whole finder would move over here, and then you would be aligned. Um, here is an example. Here's a tail rad. Here are the three set screws that change the angle of the tail rad right here. Um, this is what an aligned finder looks like. This would be uh, this is going to depend on your optics, whether things are backwards, upside down. Um, but if you want whatever's in the finder, here's a, a magnifying finder with crosshairs. You want the top of this telephone pole centered when it's centered in your eyepiece. So you need to use even a finder that magnifies initially opened eyed. Um, so it's all, as if your, your one eye sees the entire sky and sees the kind of the circle of what the finder is seeing. Um, and that's a little tricky. Uh, the circle, you see the circle that's magnifying superposed on the actual sky. Um, so you would use it almost like a tail rat initially. Once you've gotten close enough to an object in a magnifying finder, you'll actually see it. It may look like a little fuzzy blob. Um, once you've got it somewhere in the field, then you close one eye and you put that object in the center of the, of the finder. There'll be crosshairs and then you can go back to your telescope and look at it. So aiming your telescope um, normally would start with a lower power eyepiece, even if you want to look high power, um, because it's easier 
Uh, if you don't have to be absolutely centered, if you're a little bit off center, you'll still see whatever it is you're looking at. Then you center it, and then you go to your high, highest power eyepiece that you want to use. Now, if you get sets of eyepieces made by the same manufacturer, some of them will have what they call parfocal eyepieces, meaning, meaning if you're going from a low power to a high power eyepiece with that same, uh, same type of eyepiece, you don't have to refocus. Um, in other cases, sometimes the focus is different from a high power eyepiece than from a lower power. So observing deep sky objects, um, for the weather, you want what we call good transparency, or you need very clear air. You don't want a hazy night for deep sky. Um, there's a technique called averted vision, which means that the back of your eye, the, the um, center of your retina, is full of cones, not rods, which see better in the dark. So your best vision is actually a little bit off center. And so we get used to, when we're observing deep sky objects, moving our eye around, looking a little bit off center, and sometimes more details come out that way. Um, you might hear on observing field terms like perverted vision or averted imagination. This is when that person looks through the telescope and says, wow, look at all those detail and all those knots and all those dust lanes. You look in there and you're not seeing that, maybe because you're less experienced at the time. So we tease those people and call it perverted vision or averted imagination. Um, so again, uh, and then the end, you also need to use a lower power when you're looking at deep sky objects. So those are anything that's nebulous, galaxies, um, uh, uh, areas of star formation, things that look fuzzy in your telescope. This is a GIF, let me see if it works, there it goes. So this gives you as a great example of, um, of averted vision. There's a planetary nebula called the blinking planetary, which is, um, which if you look directly at it, you only see the central star. And this is, this is a low power view that this person made. So notice the nebulosity around the central star goes back and forth. You would get that effect looking directly at the central star and then uh, the nebulosity would come out better when you look a little bit away from it. So this particular planetary is nicknamed the, the blinking planetary because the nebulosity is on the very edge of being able to see it easily. Now, the other thing is that there are filters made for your eyepieces, which can enhance your view. So there's something called the um, UHC, or ultra high contrast filter. There's light or light pollution filter, which darkens the background and just increases the contrast. And um, uh, these filters need to be the same diameter as the barrel of your eyepiece. So if you have one and a quarter inch eyepiece, you need one and a quarter inch filters, or you need two inches filters for two inch eyepieces. Um, there are, um, for, oh yeah, when you observe planets, and we're going to come to filters for them too, you need what we call good seeing. So for great planetary views, it's not so important that the air be absolutely crystal clear. What is important that the, is that the air be very, very steady. In fact, sometimes a little haze is good because um, it, it actually tones down the brightness of the planet in a larger aperture. So um, for planets, we have colored filters, and um, they don't necessarily give you the best aesthetic view, but people are really um, want to make a very good sketch of a planet or get the most detail. The colors will bring out different details. So for instance, you might use one color on Mars to see the dark spotches on it the best, to see the highest contrast, and then another color filter would bring out the polar caps. So the people who draw planets will actually use a series of filters to bring out all the details. One, one filter will help you see the cloud bands best on Jupiter. Another filter will see, help you see different colors of cloud bands better. And then the most important one for observing the moon um, is the neutral density filter, which is basically like putting sunglasses on your telescope. Um, and then we have solar filters. So we have a, the simple solar filter, which simply um, cuts out 99.99% of the light, makes it safe to see the uh, sun. You'll see sunspots if they're present, and you'll get a yellow image. And notice that on a large aperture telescope, sometimes you do a smaller aperture solar filter because you don't need a lot, lot of light from the sun. Um, for observing the prominences on the sun and the granulation on the surface of the sun, you need a more sophisticated uh, filter called the hydrogen alpha filter, a very narrow band filter in uh, one or two hydrogen alpha lines. Or you can get a tel specialized telescope for that called the Coronado. And I believe we have one of those in our, in our uh, library of, of telescopes. 
Um, Barlow's are designed to mat to double or 2.5 times or three times any eyepiece. So you can have fewer eyepieces in a Barlow and get more magnifications. Uh, just be careful that you don't duplicate what you already have. So if you have a 12 millimeter and a 25 millimeter, you don't want a two times Barlow uh, because it, your 25 will then equal your 12. Um, the disadvantage of them is that they add more glass between you and the image. And this is what they look like. Here's an eyepiece here, and here's the Barlow in, uh, between the eyepiece and the telescope. Um, dealing with dew, uh, telescopes that have a piece of glass, either schmidt cassegrain or a ref refractor, uh, near the outside of the tube um, can get dew on them in our humid climates. So for those, you need a dew, uh, a dew cap. It's the simplest uh, solution. All you need to do is warm the telescope uh, surface or the, the um, lens or piece of glass slightly above the dew point, and just a piece of foam is good enough to do that. There are also heaters for your telescope. Um, here's a woman just taking a piece of foam and some Velcro, and voila, there she has a dew cap there. Um, and then the most important thing, which it took me 20 years to figure out, was the observing chair. So um, if you, when you're swinging a telescope around the sky, your eyepiece is going to be at different heights. Um, you want a chair that has a very easily adjustable seat height um, that goes up and down, and um, you'll be much more comfortable that way. And this is a low-tech version, a, a, just a, a bench, which you turn it different directions, has three different heights. Um, binoculars uh, for astronomy, uh, you want the magnification um, divided by the aperture, which is in millimeters. This is a 7 by 50 to be that difference or ratio to be at least 5. You want a bright image and a wide field of view with binoculars for astronomy. Uh, there's giant binoculars, which will be great for this comet atlas if it comes up. Um, for the giant binoculars, you cannot handhold them, so there are these very sophisticated mounts for them. And um, we have a loaner telescope program, so you can try before you buy. And then finally, um, the next, I think, revolution in amateur astronomy will be vacuum fever. Um, so of course, that would be the Rolls Royce of telescopes is getting it above our atmosphere. And uh, that's the end. I think I've lost most people, but uh, that's, that's the end of the program. No, great job, Debbie. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent presentation. And uh, I did get a few questions beforehand, and if you're okay with answering a few of those uh, over the next few minutes or so, um, yes. those. Uh, so Jennifer sent me an email earlier today, and she said she's a beginner uh, to astrophotography, and she's curious if you can suggest telescopes that can be used with DSLR cameras. Okay, so um, for those, I think the Schmidt Casses are great. I am not an astrophotographer now, but I used to have a five-inch Schmidt Cast. And they are, um, there are adapters to attach a DSL, a, a SLR onto the ends of those telescopes. Right. Um, if there's someone else who knows more about what's, what's around now, but I think the, the Schmidt casts are very well designed for attaching a, a DSLR, I hope. So, um, if, if I could jump in, Joe. Totally done. Um, I, I, I normally, uh, when I get this question, suggest if you haven't bought a scope uh, for astrophotography that um, you start out with a, um, uh, a, a, a wide, wide field refractor, uh, aperture maybe uh, uh, 70 or 80 millimeters right. uh, uh, with um, a focal ratio of uh, uh, F, F6 or F7, and there are a number of them out there. Uh, that that will serve you well, but you also have to make sure you have a uh, a, 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 a mount that uh, an equatorial mount that you can put it on because uh, um, you're going to need to uh, take uh, longer exposures, at least 30 second exposures, and uh, the sky rotates fast enough that uh, that you'll get blurring if you don't uh, uh, if you don't have an equatorial mounted uh, uh, telescope. Right. Good yeah, point. you need a good equatorial mount as your primary uh, thing, and then the kind of telescope, I guess, is almost secondary. Although I think if all the people I know seem to be using uh, refractors, I agree. But I know you can do it with the Schmidt Cassegrains too. 
You, you can. The difficulty is, is that the higher focal length uh, that uh, that comes with the uh, Schmidt Cassegrain makes it a whole lot more difficult to get the um, uh, tracking down and other thing, other things. It just uh, it complicates it a little bit more than a uh, say a a, a a 400 to 600 millimeter refractor. Thanks for the input, guys. Um, that was the only question I got beforehand. If anybody has a question that's on the call right now, or on the Zoom, I should say, um, go ahead and unmute yourself, and we'll take those one at a time and uh, probably spend another five minutes, if you're okay with that, Debbie, answering questions. Yes, yeah, I'm glad I have some experts here. Wonderful. Uh, like I said, everybody is muted right now, so you should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, and ask the questions that you have. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to the, the rest of the group here. And I see some people typing as well. Hey, Debbie, I have a question. Yes. Uh, hey, this is Aya. Thank you. This was super informative. Um, I was wondering about the Loner Telescope program. Are you guys doing anything with the stay at home alert? Um, um, are you still loaning telescopes uh, now or not really? Let me ask Joe about that. <laughs> yeah, I haven't talked well, to, to Alan in a while, but uh, you know, for the time being, given that uh, you know, we're, we're trying to keep distance and, and whatnot, uh, we don't want to transmit anything. Uh, we're, we're not doing any of the loaner scope uh, transfers right now. So there are people who have the loaner scope telescopes right now, and they're just hanging on to them until uh, it's safe to walk around and, and be able to transfer those telescopes back and forth. So I would hold off for probably another month or so, uh, but I'll send an email out to the rest of the, uh, the, the group here to let them know once we resume the uh, learner scope program. Yeah, and, and could I mention something? I, I, uh, are, are you uh, experienced right now or do you know the sky? Because there are things you can be doing if you haven't learned all the constellations yet. Um, I think that's a, um, knowing the sky is a really great prerequisite to using a telescope. Um, actually, I sort of had a natural pro progression. I didn't own a telescope for a long time. I spent a lot of time under the sky learning the constellations first. And then my parents gave me binoculars. I used those for a little while. I realized after I got a telescope that was similar to using what, the finder on my first telescope. So without a telescope, um, you can spend quite a bit of time just learning as much of the sky as possible. There is a website called www.skymaps with an s skymaps.com which has monthly maps and you click on download the latest issue from the home page and then scroll down and you'll choose the top map that would be um that would be for the northern hemisphere for the current month and there's all sorts of objects you can look at with binoculars and get familiar with where they are there's also binocular um Astronomical League program for binocular observing, and that's a great prerequisite to using a telescope. All right, uh, there was a question in the chat uh, from Vasily. Says, "Are there any observatories that allow the public to come in and observe?" And Joe Dellinger answered that uh, about as well as I could. Uh, unfortunately, here we don't have a lot of public observatories, but. Uh, the one that Joe mentioned in the chat there at uh, the George Observatory at Brazos Bend State Park uh, is open to the public every Saturday. Uh, when it is open, there have been a, a number of challenges due to flooding and weather and things like that in recent years. And if, my, if I'm not mistaken, I think the, the observatory is still closed right now uh, to be open soon, but uh, I don't have that uh, information on hand. But that is the, the one close observatory uh, that we have nearby. I know Rice University has an observatory on the campus as well. And occasionally they will have sessions or events where we're gonna invite the public out to uh, observe through the telescopes they have there. Uh, and the Astronomical Society of U of H, they also have a, a dome on the top of the Science and Research One building, uh, and they'll have some public events where they'll invite people in to look at the telescopes there as well. All right, any other questions? Um, yes, uh, we had uh, one early on and that was, uh, uh, this is being recorded, and uh, 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 and do you know uh, when and where we're going to be able to get the recorded version of this? Yes, so I am recording it right now. I plan on putting it on our uh, YouTube page. So if you search for Houston Astronomical Society um, on YouTube, you'll be able to find it there. Uh, 
we'll also include it in our list of uh, presentations that once you're logged into the, to the astronomyhouston.org website, uh, you'll see a list of all different kinds of past presentations that we've done. This will be included there as well. So we'll have it uh, in, in two locations on YouTube. Now, I don't you know, I'd also like to mention that uh, in the past, we have done detailed talks on each of the different kinds of telescopes. Right. Um, so if you want more details about each type, uh, you can find those also on the HAS website on recorded presentations. Yep, I agree. There was a question that came in um, from Sandy. Under normal circumstances, would you normally have someone to give you some hands-on lessons with the loader scopes? It's hard with no instruction manuals. You're absolutely correct, Sandy. <laughs> and that's a great thing. We have a wonderful uh, loaner scope chairperson, Alan Wilkerson. And uh, when he normally does the transfer of the telescope, he'll give you great hands-on uh, instruction on how to use the telescope. And in addition, he'll normally, you know, outside of the, the conditions we're in right now, um, we'll normally have at least once a month or once every other month uh, a session at the uh, Mendenhall Center where he takes you through the different types of telescopes, gives you an opportunity to do some hands-on practical um, learning from the, on the telescope itself. So how to adjust things, how to collimate the mirrors and things like that. So we don't have anything like that scheduled, like I said, just given the situation that we're in with uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19. But once we're able to get back to normal a bit, look at our calendar on our website and uh, you'll see that we'll have some of those sessions posted hopefully soon. And Mr. Renee said, I could uh, perhaps uh, Zoom one. We'll see if we can get something like that scheduled. Uh, it's not quite as, the same as doing it on, um, you know, hands-on, but uh, we'll take what we can get at this point. Uh, hey, Joe, there's a question in the chat, someone asking about uh, good books for beginners. Good books for beginners. Oh, great question. Uh, Debbie, did you want to take a crack at that? Boy, you know, I have a, I'm trying to think where it is. There, there's an old, there's a classic book um, by Edmund Scientific. I'm trying to remember the name of it. It may have been be actually all about telescopes. It's, it's wonderful, but uh, I'd probably have to go behind me to see if I can find it off the shelf. And I don't know what contemporary books there are. However, the um, Sky and Telescope has an excellent, has, you can look for articles online about all these telescopes. Um, yeah, turn left at Orion is good. I was going to say, this is, uh, you know, I just grabbed some books off of my uh, bookshelf here. Turn left at Orion uh, was one that, you know, for people, I, I always recommend it, getting into astronomy for the first time, wanting to learn the night sky, and wanting to know what to look for, right? It's one thing to get a telescope and, you know, look at the moon or look at some of the bright objects that are up there. But after a while, without really understanding uh, some of the other deep sky objects that are there, you kind of run out of things to, to view. So Turn Left at Orion was a, a really good one. And then uh, The Universe and Beyond for me, and, and there are going to be lots of other recommendations as well. This is by Terence Dickerson. Uh, Terence really passed away uh, not too long ago, but he had lots of great books that he had written for amateur astronomers. Uh, I always enjoyed that one. And then uh, the third one I was going to mention was uh, Practical Sky Watching. So this one is a little bit bigger uh, of a tome, right? So you can see that it's a, a bit thicker of a book than the other ones were, but uh, chock full of good information on where to actually start as, a, uh, as an amateur astronomer. And I'd like to mention the Astronomical League programs. The first objects I looked at were all the Messier objects because these are bright enough to show up in a magnifying finder or in binoculars and, and, and also in a, reason, in a relatively small telescope. You do need a dark sky, for, um, but you can get a lot of good views and uh, even a small telescope, maybe four or five inches if your sky is dark enough. Excellent. And then we have, have other recommendations in the Zoom group chat as well. So. Uh, you know, the fortunate thing is we have lots of different people who've read lots of different books and uh, recommendations are coming in there. So uh, Renee does say Nightwatch as well. So that, yeah, Nightwatch, A Practical Guide to Viewing the Universe, again, a, a, an indispensable uh, book for a lot of people who are just getting into the hobby. And I'd also just like to mention it's, it's sort of cool to just uh, pay attention and you see interesting things. So in the next uh, week, Venus is going to be setting really, really late, and uh, it's going to pass the Pleiades tomorrow night, but it's probably going to be cloudy. But it'll, by the time it's clear again, just marvel at how late Venus is setting. It'll be setting after 11 o'clock, which is pretty amazing, and it won't do that again for eight years. 
Great point, Jed. Thanks for bringing that up. And, and I believe you have written a, an article on yeah, the it org website. So uh, if, yeah, if, if you're really interested in understanding how that happens and some of the mechanics around it, Joe's written a great article. It's on the astronomyhouston.org website uh, on the front page there. So take a look at that. And you also just catch other things. So I went walking uh, last night and I happened to catch a satellite train going over which I'd never seen before in my life. It was just one satellite after another, after another, wow. all in a row. Uh, I can't, couldn't figure out what it was. It must have been one of these newly launched uh, orbital communication satellites. They weren't super close together. They were like 30 seconds apart, uh -huh. but there were three in the sky at a time, all just going and going for about 15 minutes, one after the other. I'd never seen that before. That was, that was pretty cool. Clearly that's an invasion. <laughs> we did get another question. Um, oh, I just lost it. Anyone know anything about Tasco Luminova telescopes? We were just given one by a family friend. That was from Spencer. Uh, Spencer, I don't have any experience with the Tasco Luminova telescopes. Uh, I don't know if uh, any of the other panelists that we have chiming in here have, have some experiences that they could share. Yeah, not that particular one. Um, I don't know whether they, in the past, they were sometimes not the best quality telescopes, right. but they may have something as reasonable as a starter scope now. Just if it says 525 times, uh, that may not be the best telescope. But actually, I think that my friends in Pasadena, California had something like that. And they were having, it was reasonable. They were having a little trouble aiming. And I found, what I found was that their finder was way off of alignment. And I actually had to go all the way up against the stop to get the finder aligned. Um, I don't know if something bent um, to get it aligned with the telescope. But then once I did, you could, we could look at the moon and look at a few things that way. Joe, is everything on track for uh, doing the same thing tomorrow night? Yes, good, good uh, segue there. Thanks, Bill. Uh, so for those of you who are interested in joining us again for our general meeting, uh, we will have that tomorrow night, same time, 7 p.m. Uh, through Zoom. So if you haven't had a chance to register for that, please do. It's a different link than what we use tonight. Uh, if you don't have a link or uh, the, the registration email, you can email me, president at astronomyhouston.org, and I will send you the, uh, the link so that you can register. Once you register online, you'll get another email that actually has uh, the link that you can click to join. So tomorrow's presentation, um, we've got a... a, a fifth year PhD student at uh, Texas A&M University. His name is uh, uh, Vince, uh, I apologize, I forget the name. Don, you might be able to help me out. Uh, Vince, Vince Estrada. Carpenter, Estrada, yes, Vince Carpenter Estrada. And he's doing, a, um, he's doing his studies on uh, galaxy evolution, and he's focusing on uh, a lot of data that's coming in through a special type of spectrograph, which is a, a way of, of collecting a, a certain portion of the light wavelength. And um, it's going to be a pretty interesting talk. So again, if you don't have that link, and if you haven't registered yet, you can send me that email, presidentastronomyhouston.org, and I'll get the invitation over to you to register and get the link uh, for tomorrow. Thank you, Bill. All right, any other questions before we wrap up? Going once? Going twice? All right. Well, th hey, thanks again, everybody, for joining. Debbie, thank you very much for, for the great informative talk. Uh, like thank I said, everyone. we'll go ahead and get the recording put up on our website and on the YouTube channel soon. And uh, if you have any questions about anything that Debbie discussed, uh, again, you can send those to us, and, and we'll be glad to uh, give those a, a crack when we um, can do so via email so that we can answer those questions. And then I uh, hope to see you all tomorrow at the meeting, the general meeting. And uh, anything else that you need, please, like I said, email me. We'd be glad to uh, help you out. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night, and we'll hopefully see you all tomorrow. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye.